Municipal Member for Winnipeg Centre. Center. It's a pleasure to be speaking today on the Budget Implementation Act C-63 and truly speaking on the issues related to the Budget Implementation Act number two. This is an interesting piece of legislation. Budgets are important because they impact the people on the ground, average Canadians, average people. And it's my belief that a budget is a real reflection of the will of a people. I think of the people in my riding who care, who, who came to me and talked to me about, for instance, subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. They came to me in May of 2016. They spoke to me with great passion. They talked to me about their beliefs, how they wanted to make the world a better place, Madam Speaker. They said, we want to make sure that we can make room in this world so that there's room for other human beings and that we can look after, after each and every one of us. They believed in ideals like simplicité volontaire or sim uh, voluntary simplicity. There are people in the areas of my riding like Wolseley. And they, when they come to these young people and they say, what are you going to do about the environment? Are you going to fulfill your promises that you made during the election? say, of course, I'm going to fight for you every day to fulfill those promises. Now, as an Indigenous person, I have heard from my elders. And treaty is a buzzword today that we often use. It was a buzzword a thousand years ago as well. Waka Sejak was the very first man. When the Creator, when the Great Spirit created all beings, when he created the two-legged ones, the four-legged ones, those that could fly when he created the rivers and streams and mountains and sky. He created last of all man, and that was Waka Sejak. And he said to all the animals, he gathered them together, and he said to them, who will protect this man? Because it is cold today, and he is cold. And the buffalo said, I will give him my fur so he can stay warm. And the birds said, we will give him food and sustenance. We will provide him with something to feed himself and his families. They had treaty. They had relationship with each other. It was not something to be taken lightly. When I said, Niwako Makantik Tanse, Nimiatani Awapam Tikuk, it says, I honor all my relations. You have to honor all of our relations because we have treaty with everything that exists in this world. If we use something, we must honor it afterwards. If we use an animal or a being, we must honor it in a good way to make sure that we do not waste, we do not destroy, that we continue to cherish, love, care, and protect. And those things today are sometimes very hard, but that's what I saw in the people who came to speak to me in May 27th of 2016 in my writing. Now, the world's largest economies in 2009 agreed to phase out subsidies for oil and other carbon dioxide fossil fuels in the medium term as part of efforts to combat global warming. <coughs> Some $300 billion a year is spent worldwide to subsidize fuel prices, boosting demand in many nations by keeping prices artificially low and thus leading to more emissions. This agreement in 2009 was backed by all G20 countries, including Russia, India, and China. It was a victory for the United States President, Barack Obama. He said, this rural reform will increase our energy security and it will help us combat the threat posed by climate change. He also said all nations have a responsibility to meet this challenge and together we have taken a substantial step forward in meeting that responsibility. It is my belief that eliminating such subsidies by 2020 will reduce greenhouse gas emissions blamed for global warming by 10% by 2050. <coughs> And this was also highlighted by the International Energy Agency and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. In a statement from the G20, comprised of the major rich and emerging economies, 
Energy and finance ministers said they would develop timeframes and strategies for implementing the subsidies phase-out and report back at the next G20 summit. Now, it was our Prime Minister back then, the Honourable, Right Honourable Stephen Harper, who was the one to act on behalf of Canada at this G20 summit. In 2015, he agreed to a final communique for the G7, which emphasized or which said, we emphasize that deep cuts in global greenhouse gas emissions are required with a decarbonization of the global economy over the course of this century. Our Parliament also voted last June in 2017 to accept that the Paris Accord is a necessary step to fight climate change. These are all truths. But another truth is that the Liberal Party promised in our 2015 platform and I will quote, we will fulfill Canada's G20 commitment to phase out subsidies for the fossil fuel industry. The next step will be to allow for the use of the Canadian exploration expense tax deduction only in the case of unsuccessful exploration. The savings will re be rejected, re redirected to investments in new and clean technologies. That is an engagement on our behalf of all Canadians that we decided to fulfill in the Budget Implement Implementation Act number two. I will say now a quote what we actually are going to be doing in the Budget Implementation Act in, rela in relation to the fossil fuel subsidies. The success rate for exploratory drilling have increased substantially since the 1990s, and in major cases, discovery wells now lead to production which makes the well an asset of enduring value. The measures contained would modify the tax treatment of successful oil and gas exploratory drilling, consistent with the usual treatment of enduring assets, expenses associated with oil and gas discovery wells, and they will be treated as Canadian development expenses unless and until they are deemed unsuccessful. This measure supports Canada's international commitments to phase out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. I had the opportunity of sitting on the Finance Committee for the past for two years almost. And I remember asking the Taxpayers' Federation about fossil fuel subsidies. And I asked them what they thought about them. And they said they were against corporate welfare in any form. But we also recognized on the Finance Committee that we need to take a balanced approach. That yes, there was and there was, still is continuing issues in Alberta related to employment. But I believe it is a balanced approach that we have tried to take not simply coming in and applying what we believe right away, but taking the time to listen and to consult. We have waited for Alberta to lift itself, to ensure that we have other programs which can take the place, to ensure that we have good economic development in Alberta. In my belief, we are fulfilling a promise of treaty to all our relations. We are fulfilling a promise of the Right Honourable Stephen Harper, one that we are willing to keep because it is important. We are willing to fight for the environment, fight for the beliefs of Canadians and fulfill our promises which were contained in our 2015 platform. And I am proud that even a little bit of work asking some of those questions on the Finance Committee allowed us to ensure that today we are fulfilling that 2015 promise fulfilling what should have been done in 2009-2011. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you very much. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Beauport Limoilou. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague from Winnipeg Centre for his remarks. His introduction was very interesting. He was talking about the relationship Indigenous peoples have with animals and the earth, and really about the genesis of uh, humanity. And there's a sacred relationship between people and the earth. In the 2015-2016 budget and in the 2017 budget, the Liberal government decided to put billions of dollars 
into a fund to uh, help countries fight climate change. Now, it, that money isn't necessarily going to be used for that, but here's the question I want to ask. Because he's an anthropologist, can we seriously, seriously ask this current generation of Canadians to pay for the mistakes of our ancestors who polluted uh, the planet? Is it ethical, from an intergenerational point of view, and from an international point of view, to send billions of dollars overseas to make up for mistakes that our ancestors made? Is that ethical? The Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member for beauport Limoilou for his question. His question is an interesting one. Now, uh, as an anthropologist, one knows that cultures evolve. Cultures are constantly evolving. But here is what is certain. It's important to be in the present, even if our parents have made mistakes. For example, my parents made all kinds of mistakes in my life, uh, in the way I was raised, maybe, for example. However, I have a responsibility to correct these to the greatest extent possible for the benefit of my children. And yes, there is a balance that we have to find in our society between what we're trying to do for the environment and what we're doing for the economy. But I do think it's possible. And even if subsidies are provided to poorer countries, it's still important to make sure that we ourselves are progressing and that we're all progressing together because we don't want to be an island, even if North America is Tudor Turtle Island. Questions or comments? The Honourable Member for Hochelaga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My colleague spoke about the protection of the environment, and so my question is this. It's related to the environment, but it's also related to housing. I'm the housing critic for my party, and so I would like to know why in the budget there's absolutely nothing for eco-energetic retrofits. So if we were to include the principles of energy retrofits, not only would we help improve the environment, but we would also be helping in keeping costs low in housing and for social housing. So I think there are many benefits to doing this. Now, given my colleague's vision that is informed by his Indigenous culture, is he not somewhat disappointed that his government does not have the same vision as he does regarding the environment and housing? The Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Thank you very much for the question. Last Friday, I had an opportunity to make an announcement on housing in Winnipeg. It was announced at a homeless mission. And we had an opportunity to talk about how that policy would unfold for Canadians. In the announcement, I said that the environment is important for me and that it will play an important role. We have to build homes that can be as energy neutral as possible for the environment in terms of emissions. And at the time I, I said that, I, I read it out. And I think that's something that we do have to work on. We also have to listen to local communities. Yesterday, I had an opportunity to speak with people who are trying to build foundations for homes in the north so that these homes won't move once they're built, so that they'll be more stable and so that cracks won't appear in their homes. So this is dependent on design. Design is very important. It's very important to ensure that we build homes that are, will last longer. But we have to convince local communities of the importance of building these kinds of homes. It's not something that we can impose. There are many indigenous communities, for example, where people decide to come in and experiment with new things. And these communities 
uh, start getting a little fed up. They want people to try their experiments elsewhere as well. So it's important to be able to convince people so that they do this on their own will. The time is almost expired.